Welcome everybody to the Magic Beans podcast. We're here for a special episode, kind of episode five, kind of episode five and a half, maybe episode six, we're not really sure. But after the technical difficulties we had on the previous episode, we thought, why not? Let's just record a special episode, a little bit of a bonus for you guys out there. So there's a few of us together. We thought we'd actually try recording one live and and see how that goes. It might be garbage as well, and, and maybe the previous one was even better than this, but we'll see how we go. So for the first time ever recording, I have Chewy and Chris actually sitting right in front of me. It's a little bit awkward, a little bit weird, a little bit different, but we're hoping we can do something pretty cool for you guys and, and have a bit of a chat together live um, a little bit more free-flowing sort of thing should be pretty good we thought we'd have a sort of an extension on chatting about how we do our testing so how you going guys you, you glad to be here good a little bit cold but uh doing well yeah awkward and and weird it's kind of us so uh we're, we're <laughs> that's just standard so. Stand, yeah it's good no no we're, we're going to talk about modern today yeah oh yeah yeah yep. yeah that's right yeah <laughs> that's right it, it is uh we're recording after midnight for some reason <laughs> no idea why we decided to do that but we're going to give it a crack and see how it goes so. pretty exhaust, exhausted from uh a kid's party uh today so um yeah, we have a lot of sugar consumed, so um, if we're talking really quick, uh, maybe we can fix that in post-production. Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> yeah we'll, we'll edit that somehow. It's, yeah. also, it's also about six degrees, so if we're talking fast, it's because we want to get to bed. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, very good. So, yeah, we were hoping tonight to do a bit of testing ourselves, and unfortunately it hasn't quite ended up that way, so we thought we'd just have a bit of a chat about it anyway, um, Yeah, and go into a little bit more about what our plans are in terms of our testing for this upcoming MCQ and how we're sort of planning on going about that. So who wants to kick it off and give us a bit of their uh, bit of their thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I guess the, the, first, the first phase in, you know, a, a, a testing cycle, to, to coin a phrase from, from, my, from my work, <laughs> um, is uh, you actually want to figure out what deck you're going to play. Uh, so there's... You know, there's a few factors that you you need to take into account um, when you are testing. You know, like the deck that you you want to play, um, how to play it well, and then what to do in specific matchups. So I guess that would be like the the, the chapters of this episode. I guess yeah. um, at a, at a high level, um, and I, I think I'm settled on a deck uh, on just on. Uh, you know, there's a lot of factors that influence the deck that you think you'll play at a large event. And for me, uh, there's a deck that I'm really just interested in playing and I'll kind of, and I think the deck's good and I'll have to be convinced to play something else. I'm open to that, but my testing, uh, for, yeah, phase one, that identifying a deck would be solely based on, uh, being convinced that that deck is a bad choice. So now, how do you go about? finding like like settling on that deck like what what led you to choosing that deck and how did that process go oh so a a number of factors and it may differ tournament to tournament um usually you know you have a look at what's being played magic online deck lists results from other tournaments um you know decks that you've played in the past you know in in modern i've had experience with with various decks um you know i've played a lot of affinity for example and I I wouldn't be confident sleeving up, um, you know, mem nights and cranial yeah, plating. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I looked at uh, looked at the decks that were performing well and wanted to find uh, a deck that interest interested me. And you know, in a, a dusty corner of my collection were my um, my Urza's Mines, Towers, and Power Plants. <laughs> and um, I thought, well. I'll, I'll have a look at Tron. I had a look at some Tron variants, and I liked the idea of um, Eldrazi Tron. And uh, just just as in, I played that deck in Legacy. And looking at the other decks in the format of Modern at the moment, I think Chalice of the Void on one uh, is a you know one of the best things that you could probably be doing in the format at the moment. Definitely Turn two eight eights might be a good thing to do, but. Yeah. <laughs> uh, out <Quite> <laughs> Out, we'll probably, we might talk about that, but um, yeah, Chalice on one seems really good, and that's something that that interests me. Um, and I, I, you know, the the toolbox sideboard strategy with Khan the Great Creator 
I think the deck has a lot of play to it in, in that, in the cards that you choose to have in those slots in your sideboard and then the actual gameplay of, you know, when to pull the trigger and, and go and get which card. So, yeah, it's a deck that's interesting to play and I think it's a deck that's really well positioned. So, so it started off as... Uh, that was the cards you had, really. Like you, you, you've got the cards of that deck, and, and yeah, 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 absolutely. And like, I think that's true for a lot of modern players. Yeah, yeah, especially yeah. for yeah. a format like modern that's so expensive. Yeah. It's um, people buy into their deck, into their archetype, and that's what they play. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like yeah. Mox Opals and Chalices of the Void and Scalding Tarns are, are, are not cheap cards. So, um, yeah, you're working with what you've got available, effectively. So. And, you know, I think I could, I could probably cobble together with, you know, borrowing some cards. I could play traditional Tron, um, but I, I – well, I think that's powerful and it's, you know, results have, you know, certainly shown that it can win tournaments. Um, yeah, the the lure of chalicing my opponents out and, <laughs> yeah, you know, while I'm attacking with my reality smashes, you know, that, that that's something that's appealing to me. Yeah. I, th- I think the old Drazi Tron shell is a better Khan the Great Creator shell as well. Yeah, well, you can block and keep your Khans alive, I think. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I I do like that. And the, um, you know, Reality Smashes and, and Thought Not Sears present good clocks against control decks and the Matter Reshapers are, are good value creatures against the, the grindy mid-range decks. So, the deck can be a little bit bipolar. Sometimes it goes turn three... Tron and does big things and other times it just kind of plays one land at a time and you get there the hard way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> plays a turn three thought not zero. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And sometimes that's too slow, but um yeah, it's a if you're playing against a lot of the decks in the format, then yeah, shutting off shutting off their one mana spells. The same as it has in as I mentioned, I've played the deck in Legacy. So yeah. So, yeah, I'm pretty settled on the deck, which is pretty different to some of the other beans, I think. So, yeah, I think <laughs> both me and Chris, we're, yeah. we're both still undecided. Yeah, I'm I'm really on the fence. I think going through um, deck selection, so I know one, one of the things just amongst ourselves, we we're talking quite a bit in the weeks leading up to MC Barcelona about, oh, what do we think about modern? And we all kind of circled around and were like, cool, let's let's maybe wait and see what washes out at the end of the Mythic Championship and see just what the best players in the world are bringing to the table and playing. So now that that's wound up, um, that probably formed the starting point for me for what I would deem to be the kind of current tier one decks. Playable. Yeah. Um, so, H- Hogak was yeah. um, obviously the biggest represented deck, had the best win rates out of anything. In a hateful field as well yeah. with in, all in those a, ley lines. Yeah. Um, and so, I, I kind of think subject to no bannings, that deck just seems like the most powerful yeah. thing so to be doing seems in modern. Like you should just be playing that deck if, yeah. it's, if it's not banned. <clears throat> So, what do you do if the format adjusts, though? So, if someone, well, if, if large swaths of people, swathes of people decide that blue white control with four path to exile and main deck rest in peace, do you just hope that you don't see that adjustment or do you have a plan for that? Uh, I'm planning on not seeing much as there is control, <laughs> but. But when you when you look at the MC and you look at how much main deck graveyard hate was being packed and the representation of how much targeted hate there was towards the deck and the conversion rates that still Oh it's busted were yeah. there it, post it that. It still didn't make much difference. It, it, yeah, that's right. So I think certainly exiling effects seem very good. Um I, yeah, I don't know. That there's there's been a a lot of hate. There was a lot of hate at the MC, um, and it still performed really, really solidly. So I think the deck can battle on a number of axes and still be competitive. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> on the hate at the MC, and this is me, maybe uh, devil's advocate or, or being uh, a bit cynical. Did players have their deck that they were settling on, <clears throat> and then found out about this Hogak deck and either played the Hogak deck or? didn't adjust their deck and just jammed ley lines in their board. Well, ley line is the best answer for it. Yeah, like, but... You can play Ravenous Trap. Yeah, works a little bit. You can play Rest in Peace. That's too slow. Oh, I understand <laughs> that. And, and that's kind of not what I'm saying. I'm, I'm saying the the main deck choices. Were, 
were players <coughs> playing the, you know, the could they have made better choices with their removal spells? Could the Phoenix players played more? Um, what's that one mana? No, the one mana bounce effect. Uh, uh, vapor, vapor snag, snag. Yeah, yeah. yeah and things like that could people have done um more of those things was it uh because there was you know in the week leading up to the the actual mythic championship players would have gone through their testing processes as as we are now and then you know if we get to two three days before deck lists are due like just a few days out from the tournament and then you find out about this ridiculous deck you don't have time to re- adjust so you just going to jam ley lines so if we're starting with jamming ley lines but then going okay how do i give myself percentage points in the main deck for game one where i can make it you know a 30 percent matchup rather than a 10 percent matchup um without hurting other things and that's like well maybe i'll play um you know i'll 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 change up my removal suite i'll play less fatal pushes and more uh, assassin's trophies or, or something like that and just make the the rest of the cards that aren't ley lines that come in post board or maybe their main main deck but the rest of the deck improves against the matchup does that just pull it back to the field it's still the best deck in the format just not by four lengths i think that just makes your deck worse against every other deck and it's not probably not worth it does it though like like if you swap out yeah, i mean i don't know this is just yeah, it's all it's all hyperbole, but, like, but yeah, <laughs> but I haven't played enough games of it to know. Yeah, mm. this uh, you know basing off of what other people are saying that yeah, when the best version of hate is being included in almost everybody's decks and it's still not making any difference, then it. I I, I think the point still remains that you look at you look at the MC and everyone knew about Hogak and Hogak was the most represented deck there. All the teams and all the pros were testing it and people were tuning. People were prepared to deal with Hogak. Like, the, the graveyard hate was one thing, but I think people were aware of what was going on. I think some of the Azurius control list, from what I saw from the MC, could have been tuned differently. They had a horrendous conversion rates, horrendous yeah, yeah. win rates from what I saw. And, and, um, and I think that's – there's certainly a lot of innovation that can be done – in an archetype like that. And, and, and I think that's yeah. that's, the, that's the point I'm getting towards. Yeah. So, you know, a, should Jund play less Fatal Pushes because, you know, a seven mana 8-8 eight, eight, uh, makes <laughs> Fatal target. Push look pretty stupid. <laughs> yeah. But for an extra mana, which is, you know, a, a, a two mana is very different to one. Um, I can't counter it with my Chalice, for instance. But um, it would improve the Hogak matchup. It might make you worth in other spots if somebody rocks up with, you know, infect, for example, uh, if if they think everyone's going to be playing Tron after the results of the uh, the Mythic Championship, then you know you may get people who want to play infect as an example, right? So having push is much better than um, the the trophy there. But mm. if it if it's one percent of the meta game that is the uh, the decks that you want <laughs> the one mana removal spell, but twenty percent of the meta game is Hogak, then getting rid of push and adding trophy to, to, to just labor that example um, would be would be much better so it, it all comes down to I think what you expect to see and I don't necessarily think the MC meta reflects what we might be seeing yeah, in our I, I would um, not be qualified 20 <laughs> percent yeah um, <laughs> you know tournament there's, in a few weeks. there's massive differences there's, yeah. there's there's open deck lists that are, are a factor and there's the that's a huge factor and yeah. I think yeah. that influenced a lot of people's main deck decisions as well yeah um, yeah I don't I don't think I would not expect anybody to be going to an MCQ and playing main deck Leyline of the void it's just yeah, in I think it's too so many risky. matchups. It's just a completely yeah. dead Look, card. But when you're playing open deck lists like at the MC, and you sit down and you go, "Ah, oh, okay, my opponent's playing Hogak. Cool. I'm going to mull into that. If I draw my Lail under the Void, or I need my opening hand, or I want to cast it late, or whatever, then that's great. But if it's you know in my my I mulligan to six, I can put it on the bottom of my library because I don't need it. Yeah. Because you're playing one of something that Eldrazi doesn't Trump, use the, right? Yeah, yeah. Something that doesn't use the great. <laughs> so if anybody's coming to <laughs> Uh, MCQ Melbourne, and I, I, I strongly encourage them to play 
main deck Leyla and Avoid because it's uh, good for me. <laughs> <laughs> Just a heads up. Yeah. So, yeah. Chris, so you're you're <clears throat> leaning towards if Hogak doesn't get banned, you're thinking you're, you're probably keen to play it, which I, I don't blame you for. I, th- I think it feels like the best deck and the most powerful thing to be doing in modern, and I think that's where I want to be in modern is being proactive and doing yep. the most powerful thing yep. yeah, that I, I can be doing. Outside of that, I really love the Urza decks, um, and I just have a bit of a thing for Thop to Sword combo <laughs> anyway. So the the Urza decks had, I think, the next best win percentage if yep. you kind of lob um, Hogak and Hogak Dredge into one archetype. Still, um, Urza had really good conversion rates. Tying that into deck selection for a tournament, I'm I'm then questioning my ability to play a deck that's quite complex and has a lot of tough decision points my ability to play that at the level required for the length required for a tournament so that that's that's another thing that comes into my decision making process when i'm looking at a deck uh yeah. to play is, is is can i play it like it would be similar to playing azuri's control yeah. i think for yeah nine rounds and, and that comes back to that being proactive the that old magic adage there's no such thing as the wrong threat but there is that wrong answer. The wrong answer. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. And, that, it, and that's one of the hard things with blue eye control is you need to have the right answers, otherwise at the right time. Yeah. Otherwise, yep. you're doing nothing. Um, so the, uh, another con- uh, another consideration in uh, you know playing a full day of playing a certain deck is can you actually finish your rounds on time? And if you're playing a really complicated yeah. deck yep. that you're not super familiar with, you know, you've just picked it up, oh, this is the best yep. deck, whatever, <laughs> but you're not familiar with, yep. you're going to take longer to play your turns, which leads to longer match uh, game times, which means you end up in going to turns, running at a time in, in each round, uh, which leads to draws, which is no good for, for anybody. So yep. I think you, uh, you're, that's a you're giving up percentage points yeah, yeah, if yeah. you're choosing to go that route. Yeah. So and, and you do take your time when you play as well, Chris. You, yeah, don't, yes. you don't slow play, but you do make sure that you're calculating so uh, all of the percentages of each play, which is something that I'm learning from you. <laughs> I don't do enough. No, I certainly don't. Yeah, there, there are times where... Yeah, I, I think I know the right thing to do and two turns after I've made a decision, I realise it was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Usually for me, it's three seconds after I've made that decision. <laughs> oh, that, was, that was the wrong thing to do. Oops, so what I'm do you mean I played this thing into your chalice for one? <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> so, Chris, uh, another thing, like Chewie mentioned, his deck selection initially is sort of based on cards that he had. As has been mentioned on this podcast many times, you do not have that restriction. <laughs> does, does that no. make choosing a deck harder then? Yeah. It, uh, like it, 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 it means you've got a million <clears throat> options, so you, you can go any way you want to go. Yeah. Does that make it harder? It it does because I'm, I'm starting from a position of what is just the best deck and do I think I've got the skill to be able to pilot, but yeah. <laughs> pilot it basically. <laughs> so, that like that, that's- Again, brings me around to Hogak, where I think it's it's linear, it's proactive. I think it's the most powerful deck. I think that is just the right selection choice. Um, but certainly, if the I mean, if the top dog was Jund or, or or something like that, I would be pretty strongly considering other options. I think just for that reason, yeah, um, Jund, Jund is kind of a little bit in the camp of blue white control where you need the right answers you know, yeah it's do i need my fatal pushes or do not or do i need assassin's trophies and yeah if you get that wrong mix in your deck construction then you're just gonna have a horrible day anyway so yeah the, ir- yeah. the irony of those those kind of controlling mid-range wherever you want to slot them is they're vastly better when the metagame narrows and when you've got a huge representation of something like hogak or graveyard related strategies Usually, the more those lists can be tuned to a narrower meta, I think they just perform better. Absolutely, in yeah, those definitely. their answers line up better. Yeah, against, yeah. Right. more matchups. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so you would, I don't know, you you would assume that it is better positioned. Maybe that's part of the Jund resurgence that we've seen a little yeah. bit. Um, yeah, I think so. Yeah, Jund Jund works a little bit better in a field where it knows what it's going to be facing. And yeah. You can, yeah, specifically target those things. Also, so, Ren and Six. Yeah. Awesome. So, if <laughs> <Great cut. laughs> if Hogak were to be banned or something was banned out of that deck, um, barring 
any sort of radical change by Wizards where they decide to ban Ancient Stirrings and Faithless Looting and Mox Opal and a whole bunch of other stuff and just get rid of it all in one go, which I've definitely heard other people <laughs> suggesting on other, <laughs> other podcasts. Uh, if it was, say, just Hogak that gets banned, what are you leaning towards and how, how will you make that decision on, on what you're going to play? My heart tells me Urza. Um, I think my head would probably tell me humans. Okay. Um, it's a deck you've had a lot of experience yeah, I've, with. I've, I've played it a lot. played that a lot. I think it's still a really good deck. I think it's probably better if Hogak's not in the meta. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. Jund is a tough matchup, so if Jund sticks around, I yeah, I, I, don't, I yeah, don't know. Like another thing to consider with Jund especially, or specifically Jund, is it is a super expensive deck. Like it's two grand US sort of thing for, for that deck. It's not a deck <clears> that people can just pick up because it's good at the time. You, you've got your Jund players that have had their Lilianas and, and all that sort of stuff forever and half their decks foiled out, that sort of thing, that will pick it up because it's good and, and they'll play it. Oh, Jund's good at the moment. Sweet, I'm going to get there and Jund people out. But your average person who just wants to pick up a deck because it's good, they can't pick up Jund. So. Not not an optimal version, at least. No. Yeah, mm. yeah like this, it's just crazy. And Ren and Six is super expensive, which just adds, adds to it as well. So Well, Ren and Six is about the same price as... Liliana's in the deck, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah that's yeah. eight hundred dollars on planeswalkers yeah. is crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's tough Probably to get slots in Jund, and that's because they need to meet a price criteria. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's one way to look at it. <laughs> um, no, I, I think hum- humans. It's got. It's a proven deck. It's a proven archetype. It's got enough disruptive elements. There's a couple of. There's a few a few lists that are picking up things like Unsettled Mariner um, and dropping them into some of the flex slots. Um, yeah, you, you've usually got a few slots to play within humans. Yeah. There's, a, there's a little bit you can tweak it, but it's 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 got disruptive elements. It plays the aggro plan really really well, um, and I think it's just a a good all round solid deck. Yeah, um, and uh, and I guess so for you it's all right, I, I, I want to play the top deck, which I'm identifying based on stats and, and things I'm hearing, that sort of stuff. I'm identifying that as Hogak. If something happens and I can't play that because it gets banned or whatever, you're going to fall back on the deck that you know the best that is also still well positioned. So that's that's uh, what I'm kind of getting at with this is how are we identifying the deck that we want to play without being able to do a week solid of testing? Yeah. So, for you, it's, okay, this is the deck I know, and it's still pretty good in the, in the metagame and that sort of thing. So. And I think that sums up modern. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, Modern is definitely a format where if you know the deck and you know how to play it and you know how the matchups go, you get a lot more... You're rewarded points. for knowing your deck, yeah, for sure. definitely. Absolutely. And that's something that I personally have struggled with because I tend to flip-flop between decks every <laughs> every five minutes <laughs> and I, I never spend the time to master a deck and yeah I, I've always tried to just you know play what I think is the best at the time but I've never really stuck with decks and, and played them and really learned them inside out and that, and that sort of thing so that's definitely a, a, an issue for me but I'll probably never change that. I, I like <laughs> I like playing new decks and trying something different. Oh that that's what motivates you to play but what I hope for you is that you find that deck. I've found it at various points uh, along my modern journey. And, you know, sometimes the deck's good, sometimes it's not. But if you've found a deck and dedicated to it, I think you could have some, like, yeah. proper success with it. So yeah. the, the closest I think I've come to that is Blue Red Phoenix. That's, I've, I have played a good amount of that. I'm by no means any sort of expert at it. But I've, I've played a fair bit of it and I enjoy playing it. Um I'm not 100% sure if, if Hogak stays around. I'm not 100% sure how strong it actually is at the moment in the metagame. Um, from what I'm hearing from other people, they think the, the mono red or the, the red mm. with red and six versions are better at competing in a Hogak metagame. So yeah, I, I may, may play that. It's, they're not, they're similar, like similar styles of play. So a lot of the sort of, practicing that's gone into playing is it phoenix definitely transfers across um and it is also a style of deck that i i will enjoy playing so um so is that your fallback then uh yeah <laughs> as i said on the, on the previous <laughs> podcast it's it's so dependent on what happens with with hogak um <laughs> Yeah, I, I just don't know. So, I say, give, give me a Hogak is banned and Hogak is not banned. If, if, Hogak, if Hogak gets banned, I will play Blue Red Phoenix. Yep. If it doesn't, I will 
probably most likely play mono red or mono red with ren and sixes if Chris lends me some ren and sixes because I know he's got a whole bunch of them. Okay. <laughs> if, he, well, if he's playing Hogak, it's ren and eights because there's two play sets. It, we'll edit that bit out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's after so midnight, like we said. We'll, we'll, we'll see, but. Yeah, for for me, I, I I just don't know. It's it's hard, but I guess for like some advice for people trying to decide what deck to play at home, how do we go about? You know, if I if I go, all right, I'm I'm thinking I'm going to play or, or Chris. Let's take Chris's example. Chris is thinking he's going to play humans. What do we do to see if that deck's even viable? So for for us, we normally get together, jam a bunch of games, is and and what's our what are we trying to get out of that? You know, how many games are we playing before we go, no, nah, this deck's no good? You know, are we? how do we actually do the physical practice? Yeah, so I think they're, yeah, getting together and playing games, identifying the, the, the boogeyman or boogeymen or boogey people of the, the format. So uh, in this format, it's pretty obvious that, you know, you want to be able to beat a, um, a Hogak deck. Uh, so you want to play games against that. And there's a, a combination of intuition, uh, you know, how the deck actually feels in the matchup. Like, do you feel like you can actually win? And you then have to then compare that to how many games you do actually win. Um, there's also, like, a lot of learnings from that as well. Like, how you win those games or how you lose those games is really important. Yeah, there's no, no point chalking up a win when it's your opponent got mana, mana screwed. Yeah. Exactly, like it's that. kind of a, just a non-event. Yeah, but point, Pointless game. Um, so, Shorty, you and I had a few games uh, last week or two weeks ago, whenever it was, where we played... Uh, you were playing Urza and I was on Eldrazi Tron and the only games I won were being able to get a Khan on the board with... Uh, an ensnaring bridge and no cards in hand yeah. and then finding a walking blister and just pinging you for a couple yeah. of points a turn. Now, that that was the only way that I felt I could win that match up based on the, the very small subset of games that we played. <coughs> so, one of the things that I would have to decide was how do I improve that? Like, is there anything I can do uh, with my sideboard or my main deck that can improve that? Because if that... If the game becomes all about that, then you know I'm going to braid away from just losing that yeah. that matchup every time I play. So yeah. um, there's there's that need for you know understanding the important cards, the important plays, um, how you're actually going to win, and and strengthening those um, those points as, as well as trying to shore up some of the weaknesses that you've got. So every deck's kind of got different examples of that, and you know that's why we have sideboards. But you know. If you're playing against Hogak and you've got four Leyline of the Voids, is that actually enough? You know, do you need a Graft Digger's Cage and a Tormod's Crypt thrown in there as well? Yeah. Uh, so, it's... Yeah. So, uh, like we mentioned, we don't have a week to get together and, and jam games all day. How many games would we normally play? You know, we'd sit down, I'll sit down opposite Chewy and go, all right, let's play this matchup. How many pre-board games, how many post-board games would we give a matchup just to get a feel of... of is it winnable? Is it completely one-sided? What What's that sort of thing? How many w- would you reckon we would normally do? Uh, a couple of pre-board games, do you think, Chris? <laughs> I, th- I think we usually do two or three, two or three pre-board games, and usually a few more sideboard games, three yep. or four usually. The, yep. the, the short answer is not enough. Like yeah, our, our sample sizes are so small, enough, yeah. and it's it's time restricted. But I, I think in general, that's where we tend to land. Yeah, yeah. I, I think. Yeah, five, six, something like that sort of games. It's it's yeah. enough. It's not enough to give you data in terms of this is the win percentage of this deck versus this deck, but it's yeah. enough to give you that feel of mm. this is completely lopsided or this is very even or this is... These know, are the very, important yeah, cards, very, right? Yeah, yeah. and, and yep. even just learning that, learning what those yep. important cards are, that can go a really long way. So then when you get to the tournament and you sit down and go, okay, well, I've played this... I've only played five games against this deck before but i know this is my important card this is what i need to get to so that you can formulate that game plan otherwise you're just going into a blind and, and you've just got no idea you've just got to hope that your cards line up well against them and you're trying to leverage play skill uh which we if, don't have much of <laughs> yeah <laughs> but if you come if you're if you're a dog in the matchup you know play skill will only get you so far yeah um 
there's you can improve your play skill by uh, getting in reps with the deck, even if it's not under you know structured tournament conditions. Gold fishing the deck is actually something that I get a lot of value out yeah, of. Yeah, yeah, I, I yeah definitely do that myself. Uh, and and you can create those play pattern shortcuts that that really help you in the tournament. So playing, you know, the deck that I'm looking at playing uh, in in Eldrazi Tron, as- assembling the the lands in the correct order because some lands you want to you want to play Tron, you want to get Tron online as early as possible. Other times you want Eldrazi Temple because you've got a, you know, an Eldrazi heavy hand or, you know, in that matchup that that's what's going to give you the best mana advantage. So how to um, how to assemble that the sequence that you the sequencing you that's the words I'm looking for yeah and that comes through through gold fishing as well as you know when you're doing that you've got to keep in mind that you know what do I do here if my opponent has an eight eight trampler on turn two on the other side yeah, of the board can, can my deck actually deal with that yeah or can is this a hand I can keep when I shuffle up and draw seven yeah so you can just through those hypothetical situations that you think of you know you're almost playing a tournament in your mind as you uh or playing matchups um in your mind as you goldfish so it's not just uh, a repetitive ro- robotic thing you you have to focus on that and and think of those situations so if you're if you're playing a deck that is really proactive chris so if you're if you're going to play hogak and you sit down you go all right i'm going to go i'm going to play against blue white control that has four ley line of the void. So blue white control, they've got path to exile, they've got ley lines, and um, they've got terminus, right? That's probably the worst case that you could <laughs> yeah. think yep. of off the top of my head. Shuffle your deck, draw seven cards, play with those restrictions in mind. Restrictions breed creativity, right? <laughs> That's the theory. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so having a um, having that situation, like, is that something that you think of when you when you prepare with the deck or? Yeah, but one of the I'm I'm kind of different. I find whenever I goldfish, I end up just autopiloting, and maybe that's just a, a shortcoming or a flaw that I've got to work on. Um, but I I think Shorty, you were alluding to it earlier, where you you learn what the key pieces are and what the key components are in certain matchups, and often often your game plan has to shift to adapt to those. And like that, that's the, learning that stuff when I'm play testing is the most important thing because then I know how I need to formulate my game plan. And yeah. I think one of the key things to being successful is having a super clear game plan and yes, knowing definitely. knowing what the game is about. No, and knowing how you actually win. <laughs> yes. But yes. also how you lose, not just from your opponent killing you, like knowing how they plan on winning, but how you can lose the game from your actions yep. is, yeah, is quite important. And and that's where knowing – then knowing what that's about through play testing. yes, then that comes back to when you're, you're actually doing – like maybe then when you're goldfishing, you can be a bit more targeted and you can start running those scenarios and, and setting up plays and lines where you're executing your game plan Yep. You know, in line with that. So Yeah. Yeah. And it is difficult because you are gold fishing. Yeah. But it does just put you in the that mental space yeah. with the deck and, and, and challenging yourself because you know, if you might not get paired against blue white control to use that same example yeah. again in the whole tournament, they might have rest in peace and not lay line of the void. And Terminus is a pretty swingy card that they might not have time to set up with Jason Mind Sculptor because they're getting gacked. So, it's... <laughs> um, Everyone loves a good gack. So, but, that, but that's... Uh, yeah. Um, it's a... It's something you have to be careful of because you might just goldfish Hogak and go, this deck's busted. I just have this 8-8 with all these mates, you know, every time. And yeah. you can be almost seduced by that and yeah. you rock up to the tournament and, you know, you can be in for a rude shock. and yeah. Two if, minutes straight away. And yeah. <laughs> and, and that can tilt you. Seems pretty bad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that can tilt you for the uh, for the entire tournament. Yeah. And that's something that we'll talk about in a future episode <laughs> about how to, how to deal with <laughs> that. Yeah. And we've all been there. Yes. Um, but, yeah, I think just challenging yourself, those mental gymnastics, I think, is, uh, mm. is something that I personally get a lot yeah, out of. Yeah, that's a, that's a good way to look at it. So... Ideally, we sit down with a deck that we're considering playing and we'll jam three to five, six games against various opponents with various decks. And that gives us enough of a snapshot of either A, this deck is 
garbage and I can't beat anybody or B, this deck is absolutely broken and I can beat everybody or somewhere in the middle where it's, okay, this deck seems good, I'm winning matches, but I'm losing matches, but I'm learning what's yeah. what's important in these few matchups. And, and that really for us, that's about as far as we get yeah. in terms of there, our testing. There, yeah. is, there is a really nice um, little side benefit from that um, that testing approach in that, you know, if, if Shorty wants to play Mono Red Phoenix against humans um, and I'll play humans, um, humans isn't a deck I've had a lot of experience with, but by just by playing those games, uh, I'm gaining that experience, yeah, yeah. which will help me. Learning other decks. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So there's, whilst you're not testing your own deck or your own matchup specifically, you're learning about the format. Yeah, that's that's actually one thing I found when I, I mentioned on the previous cast, if, if anyone could understand what I was saying, <laughs> that uh, I, in the past, have done testing against myself where I've got, you know, two two screens going with two two different decks loaded up on tapped out where you're playing both decks. Yep. And, yeah, it lets you get through the games really quickly. And, and when I was doing that, I was actually going to the point of playing, like, 15 games of, of each matchup and I would record wins, losses, who was on the play, who was on the draw, all that sort of stuff to give myself a really good breakdown. But one of the biggest benefits I found from that was that I w- because I was playing the other deck, I was learning those other decks and I was learning what cards are important in the matchups and what cards I really cared about. And What um, do you think they might sideboard in against you yeah, yeah, and things like yeah, that? And, so. you know, and it even comes down to things like which creatures do I need to kill or which creatures do I not care about? Or if you're playing counter spells, which, which spells are going to actually affect, you know, how this game's going to go or can I let these ones resolve, that sort of thing. Mm. So, yeah, there's, there's definitely plenty of benefits to, to doing it that way. But, yeah, that's from our testing, that's a, generally about all we can fit in leading up to a tournament is getting together, jamming a bunch of games and, and just trying to get a feel for, for how the deck's going to go and, and just uh, trying to not go into the tournament blind. Yeah. You know, we're, we've yeah definitely tried in, in over the last few years not turning up to a tournament going, right, here's this deck, it's the best deck. I've literally never played a game with it. Like, yeah. Basically, someone's just handed it to me as I've walked in the door because it doesn't – unless you're John Finkel level player – it, it yeah. just you're losing so many percentage points by by doing that. Well, I, I think a factor for us is that our tournament time is quite precious, and and it, we spoke about this on the the podcast where we spoke about finding time to play. In that you want to you want to be prepared for a tournament because you don't want to go in and, and have a horrible experience. So yeah, another thing that we can do, and it, it is harder to do for a modern. Uh, event than it is for standard but yeah uh, online play is is an obvious one but Mm. again you know investing money in a a if you wanted to test hogak a then it's purchasing cards that may be banned before the tournament even starts (laughs) or shortly thereafter or you're you're putting money into a, a platform that you're you're not going to play so much so yeah it definitely feels rough it is hard. Yeah. yeah so for for limited events and for um standard events you know we've we've got a better pa- platform yeah to test on but we are limited in in what we can do with modern and i, I think a lot of people are probably in that boat yeah. less less so than previously but yeah i mean if you're just a regular person there might be one modern tournament during the week at your local game store that you may or may not be able to get to, there's not that many tournaments on weekends currently other than the, the sort of bigger things. Or yep. in, in Australia, at least, we don't have Star City Games and, and that sort of stuff running events all the there's time. No GP so, every weekend. Yeah, so <laughs> for us, it's yeah, you, you may get, I don't know, a couple of nights a week spaced over one to two months and that's all the testing that you get if you don't have a, a good play group so it does make it very hard in in this sort of format to to do those things and that's where yeah things like gold fishing and that are, are quite good mm. so mm. yeah well i hope we helped somebody yeah out hopefully there. yeah you get, get a bit of an insight into how we go about our little testing process which is yeah like i said not extensive but it's something that that can uh yeah gives us gives us a little bit of an edge as we go into the tournament and yeah we're not going into a blind um but yeah hopefully you you've got something out of that as well and you can put some of those things into practice but yeah if you've got any other ideas for us that 
that may help us improve as we're going into tournaments. We would definitely love to improve our game and do better at tournaments, seeing as we don't play them very often. I, I think everybody <laughs> sitting in I'm, front of me would I'm agree. I'm all ears. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you can uh, you can hit us up as, as usual. You can uh, flick us an email, uh, magicbeanscast at gmail.com. You can find us on Twitter, at magicbeanscast. Uh, look us up on Facebook or YouTube and, uh, yeah, like the page, like the uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel, all that sort of stuff. Click the little bell. It'll make me feel warm inside. <laughs> <laughs> you definitely do with feeling warm at the moment because I think it's about four degrees now. But, uh, yeah, that's that's going to do us. Uh, hopefully, you've got a little bit out of this episode. It's been been good fun recording in person together for, for a change. Staring yeah. at each other across the tables. Yeah, yeah. It's Interesting. A, yeah. Yeah. Good it's not romantic, that's for sure. <laughs> I would hope not. <laughs> All right, so that's going to do us. So we will see you next time.